Hey everyone, this is James Lindsay. You're listening to the New Discourses podcast. And the issue is never the issue. The issue is always the revolution. I want to talk about that. I think it's one of the most important maxims to describe what how the left thinks. Why on earth are we looking at, for example, this huge thing around so-called Palestine, which is a Soviet or communist object to create division in the Middle East as it is in the Arab world uh, against Israel. Why is it that there's queers for Palestine, sex workers for Palestine, feminists for Palestine, and BLM is for Palestine, and all of this is, you know, that uh, there's this incredible solidarity across all of the woke uh, neo-Marxist movements uh, to support what's happening from Islamism. Now, I don't want to talk about the roots and history and unique aspects that have led to the creation of Hamas. I'm not going to talk about the Palestinian Liberation Organization, where it came from, or the People's Front for the Liberation of Palestine, which is its parent organization. But when you hear Popular Front for the something, you know it's communist. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that. I want to talk about the idea that the issue is never the issue, that the issue is always the revolution, because that actually adequately explains everything. The woke see a revolution happening, And there are deeper reasons, but the woke see a revolution happening. They see revolutionary energy and potential. And so it doesn't matter what the issue is. They're all in for it because what they're actually for is the revolution. Now, much to their surprise, I think, um, just as long as we're talking about that specific issue uh, of of the so-called Palestinian project, uh, I think they'll find that the Muslims are actually about Islam. And they're not actually about just the revolution. And um, historically speaking, from what I understand, this has been something that's happened in in this kind of sometimes called red-green axis, the communists teaming up with, with the radical uh, fundamentalist Muslims. What apparently has happened in the past is that the communists have helped instigate these revolutions for Islamist causes, at which point an Islamist regime takes over and they tell the communists to choose Islam or death, and you don't have socialist or communist organizations or countries in the wake of these things. But I digress, because that's not the point. The point is actually that whatever the issue is, whether it's queer theory, whether it's race, whether it's sex, genders, whatever gender is, sexuality, ability status, the issue is never the issue. The issue is always revolution. In other words, those are just tools to drive toward the fundamental transformation of society into something that's put under neo-Marxist control or generally Marxist control. The issues, in other words, are throwaway objects. The people participating in the movements, whether they're racial minorities, sexual minorities, or whatever, are just useful props in order to get a regime change, a sea change in the politics that empowers the Marxists, and they will discard whatever they don't need afterwards. I mean, this is most visible where the uh, feminist movement, radical gender critical feminism, has been cannibalized by queer theory. Uh, a splinter group called Queer Theory developed in the 1980s and 1990s as a new radical politics of sex. And it has cannibalized gender-critical radical feminism. There's no coming back for the TERFs, whether they want to or not. They have no ground to stand on because their movement was useful for opening the door so far, but now it's just another political contrivance to their benefit that uh, allows them to say that sex is, is, is real and therefore can't be uh, swept up into the world of social constructivism and deconstruction. So the issue there wasn't actually the issue either. The issue was just how do we advance the dialectic of sex, gender, and sexuality to the point where we have men identifying as women and entering into women's spaces and nobody can say boo about it because the issue doesn't really matter. You know, this is really visible if we look back at Mao, and it's funny because I don't I want to talk about something else with this podcast, too, and I've gone completely a different direction than I intended to. But if we look back at Mao, when he's talking, 
in the 1950s in particular, he's explaining why there were different activities at different times. There was a time when they all rallied together to fight the Japanese. There was a time where they concentrated power in the CCP. There was a time when they did the Peasants' Revolution from 46 to 49 and have ultimately took over. Then there was the time of building socialism. And what he explains is that different things are necessary in different parts or phases or stages of the revolution. So in particular, what you don't need as you go further into the revolution is destabilizers. You don't need who hooligans going and causing problems in the street. You don't need peasants rising up against the oppression that they're being put under by their government and by, by the officials. You need them now to accept and build socialism. So who, he explains, who are the people and who are the enemies of the people changes at different times. See, the people are the people who are useful to the revolution and the enemies of the people are the people who are no longer useful or are in any way hindering this stage of the revolution. It's completely, in the most sickening way, utilitarian, where what determines utility is whether or not it advances the Marxist revolution. That's it. Every other issue is just a prop in their hands. BLM, critical race theory... Yeah, there's a lot of grift going on, but the point of those isn't anything to do with racial justice. It's extremely easy to see that if you actually look at the outcomes. You don't see racial equity. You don't see black lives mattering. You see murder rates going through the roof. You don't see any of the fruit that you would expect to see from a movement with that name. You don't see critical race theory creating racial harmony, but it's not after harmony. It's after justice. It's after equity. It's after the deliberate redistribution of shares. But race is just one thing that happens to be useful, and the second it stops being useful, just like the working class stopped being useful to them, they will drop it like a bad habit. Because the issue is not the issue. The issue is the revolution. You've really got to get this mentality into your head, because it explains so much of their lack of consistency. As time goes on, the circumstances are contingent. Right now, they need the working class to be motivated. Well, they got what they could get out of that. So now they need the feminists to be motivated. Well, they got what they could get out of that. Now they need the queer theorists to be motivated because they're going to get what they can get out of that. And then when that be becomes no longer useful, let's say it creates a gigantic rainbow guard in parallel to Mao's red guard. So you have all these broken, expensive, medically expensive pe medical patients for life. You very expensive one. Well, what are they going to do? They're going to agitate for socialist medicine. Eventually, you're going to get it. And then what's going to happen? MAID. The Canadian MAID program. <laughs> Medical assistance and dying. Because they're not needed anymore. They're not useful anymore. The destabilized, expensive burden to the system that's been broken by the revolutionary tactics becomes useless, becomes a burden, becomes a liability, and it gets dropped. That's the progression under the maxim or under the, the idea that the issue is not the issue. The issue is the revolution. And the logic is, therefore, whatever advances the Marxist dialectic is good. Whatever hinders it is bad. Whoever helps it is the people. Whoever hinders it is the enemies of the people that need to be destroyed with the full weight, the full power of... Uh, the, the, the dictatorship of the people or the dictatorship of the proletariat or the, the, the people's democratic dictatorship or whatever they end up calling it in whichever country or circumstance. Lenin said that that's what it's for. Mao said that's what it's for. They all say that's what it's for. Because the point is, once again, that the issue is never the issue. The issue is always a revolution. So pick any issue that you want. Whatever the current thing is, and that's really where we're going here, that the current thing is never the issue. The issue is always the revolution, right? So there's this, whatever the current thing is, well, maybe it was COVID. COVID wasn't the issue. The point of COVID was to install the policies to do a lot of different things, whether it's the vaccines, whether it's the vaccine mandate they attempted to put on us, whether that would have led to a vaccine passport, whether it's masking, which is bearing a lot of fruit now with these stupid protests when adults are allowed to mask in public at political rallies. Did you know that the that the Klan back in the day was running a terror campaign. You probably did know that. But one of the most effective things that was brought out to stop the Klan was that they said you're not legally allowed to mask your face at political rallies. And so people that were in the Klan could have their rallies 
I guess, but they couldn't mask their face. And if they f- were found masking their face, having a political rally, they'd get arrested, actually sent to jail. The police would actually do their jobs at some point. And it turned out that this was extraordinarily injurious to the Klan, which was actually a radical splinter that cell that had, had very little public popularity, even in a racist population. Isn't that amazing? So there were a lot of points to COVID, but the issue wasn't the issue. The issue is to advance revolution. We could take another issue. I've already talked about BLM. That was a pretext to be able to have crazy riots, to be able to go out in the streets and act the fool and carry on and destroy property and destroy lives and make corporations and individuals bend the knee and adopt the perspective of critical race theory, which is a critical theory, which is a Marxist perspective on the world so that they are more easily manipulated, more demoralized and less capable of resisting it in the future. You can see the whole thing as a gigantic attempt to foist a cultural revolution and the cultural revolutionary logic onto the population. We could call them the black guard, if you want, I guess, the red guard. I don't know what color guard you want to call them, but that's what's going on. Well, what else do we have? Well, the Ukraine conflict. (laughs) Do you think that that's real? The issue is not the issue. So the issue is not COVID-19. The issue is a revolution. The issue is not Uh, Black Lives Matter and racial justice. The issue is revolution. The issue is not Ukraine conflict. The issue is the revolution. The issue is not Gaza Floyd or the Israel-Palestine, so-called Palestine conflict. The issue is the revolution. We can do this for anything you want. The issue is not drag queens in classrooms. The issue is the revolution. Every single issue that they get you to fight and squabble about is not what matters. So this is extremely important to understand because when you understand this, you stop having the fight that doesn't matter. You start looking above the fight, I guess is a good way to put it. They want you to fight about the issue. They want you on Twitter becoming overnight, you know, the newest expert in cybersecurity or the newest expert in uh, military in the (laughs) Eastern Europe. They want you to be overnight the biggest expert in whatever the issue, the current thing is. They want you to be the new expert in, in Islamophobia or Islam itself or whatever it is so that you'll fight about it. They want you to be the biggest issue on the history of Israel that you knew nothing about 25 minutes ago. They want you to argue about the issue because when you're arguing about the issue, You're doing nothing to stop the revolution. The issue is never the issue. The issue is always a revolution. So if they can get you misdirected and generating a lot of energy, fighting, splintering, cutting friends out of your life, arguing, um, pouring energy into looking up details about something they don't actually care about, then they can advance the revolution as far as that incursion allows them to. And when they advance the incursion as far as it allows them to, and it stops, people finally catch on. Guess what? They don't care. They just launch another campaign because the issue was never the issue. The issue is always a revolution. When you kind of forget and we move forward and we get a little further down the road, guess what? They circle back to that issue and they bring it back out of the woodshed. And all of a sudden we have to deal with it again because the issue is fungible. The issue is a prop. This is the most important thing, I think that there is to understanding how they operate, how the leftists operate, and what to do about it. There is nothing that compares to, to understanding that whatever the issue is in front of the table, they don't care about it. Here's an example. I talked to somebody who actually talked to, who was in a webinar in April of 2020, with uh, one of the speakers was Randy Weingarten. So she's the president, if I'm not mistaken, of the AFT, the American Federation for Teachers, so one of the largest teachers unions. She's a menace. Every indication points out that she's at least a syndicalist, but she's probably a communist. And she was talking about how one of the things, this is in April 2020, when allegedly nobody knew anything about COVID. Well, here's the thing. COVID, or SARS-CoV-2 or whatever, is the issue. But the issue is never the issue. The issue is always revolution. She doesn't need to know shit about COVID to do what she did, which is to say that they're going to force the schools to be closed. They're going to take advantage of the ambiguity. I'm not sure how she worded it. I'm sure much less uh, clearly than I'm summarizing it. But we're going to keep the schools closed 
to make sure the Democratic nominee for president, who was going to be Joe Biden, wins, and to make sure that the federal government arranges a trillion dollars of federal money to be apportioned to education in order to do the significant structural changes they wanted to do, mostly importing more social-emotional learning in education. So she was using the children of the country and their educations and their mental and emotional health and their development. She was holding all of that hostage in order to advance her revolution in education, which advances the broader revolution because it turns the schools more thoroughly into revolutionary brainwashing installations. The pretext was COVID, which we know, and at the time even, we had good reason already to believe, barely affects kids. There's no reason whatsoever to have to do this. And then for so long that it pissed off hundreds of thousands of parents to make sure that they could get what they wanted out of it, they kept the schools closed. They kept the masks on kids' faces. They did this deliberately, not because they cared about COVID, because that's the issue. And the issue is never the issue. They did this because it enabled them to take a big step forward with a trillion dollars behind it, which is, by the way, a lot of money, to install more of the revolution. This is the way that they operate. So the thing that you have to do to counter that, to put it very simply, is that you have to learn to see above the issue and see how the issue is being used to move the revolution. That's absolutely crucial. So here's one example just within the scope of the Palestine, so-called Palestine, the Gaza versus Israel kind of conflict. So everybody got really excited, right? They said, ha, 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 look at that. Even the Arab countries, the Muslim countries around, Muslim majority, I suppose, countries around the region won't accept the refugees from Gaza, which might number as many as 2 million. They won't even take them. They don't even want them. They know that they're going to be infested with terrorists and Hamas and blah, blah, blah. That was the line. And people thought, wow, that's really telling about how bad those people are. No, no, no. You don't understand. The issue is never the issue. The issue is always revolution. And they know that Western nations like Canada, the United States, and especially Europe, Canada and, and, and Europe being overwhelming, have a real soft spot for refugees. So if they can provoke a powerful military response from Israel. So remember, your target's reaction is your real action. They can provoke that, justify it or not, doesn't matter, because the next thing they're going to do is mystify the situation by framing it that this is an unprovoked attack or an unjustified attack or a continuation of a genocide against the poor Palestinians and particularly the poor people of Gaza who live in this open-air prison, blah, 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 right? And eventually, if Israel fights and fights and fights and Hamas holes up in Gaza and other places and continues to provoke and provoke and provoke, and these demonstrations across the West continue and continue and continue, the solution to this problem is going to be these poor innocent people in Gaza, these poor innocent Gazans need to be relocated. The Arab nations nearby, Egypt, uh, Jordan, Syria, all the rest, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, they, they don't want them. They won't take them. So guess where they need to go? Canada, USA, Europe. And here you have, especially in Canada and Europe, you have huge populations that we're seeing. We see them also in the United States. In fact, what we're seeing is lots of people that seem to have come across our southern border because they're here, here illegally are the ones participating in these riots across the city after Gaza Floyd has blown things up. And you really should think of it as Gaza Floyd. Gaza Floyd is, should be the name of the operation. You can call it Hamas Floyd if you want. It doesn't really matter. They provoked Israel. They're taking advantage of the reaction that Israel, in my opinion, justifiably has undertaken. And they're taking advantage of that reaction to push this mass movement. And what, do you, what are you going to see? You're going to see half a million, maybe, maybe a million, maybe a million and a half highly radicalized, pissed off people displaced out of Gaza with God knows how many of them actually not just sympathetic to, but actually part of Hamas coming along with into the West to fuel these cells that are already here. Because the issue is never the issue. The issue is always the revolution. It's not really what's happening on the ground. That's the propaganda war. So that's what I wanted to actually kind of dive into as kind of an intellectual exercise for this podcast. This is a 
very controversial thing to talk about, and it's very weird for me because I'm about to give a lot of credit, more credit than he's due, really, to a French postmodernist by the name of Jean Baudrillard. Now, I'm not a huge um, fan of Jean Baudrillard, but I will say that he was very perceptive in ways that I don't attribute to the other postmodernists. Now, he's still a leftist. Capitalism was still the problem, the whole nine yards, but that's beside the point. In 1991, right after the Gulf War, John Baudrillard wrote a series of three essays that got summarized into, or aggregated, I guess, into a book that was very fringy. It has pretty low ratings. I've read the book. I actually think it's very peculiar, mostly a waste of time. Um, But then its central thesis is very interesting. And that central thesis is the title of the book. The Gulf War did not take place. Now, that's a controversial thing to say. It wasn't really well received by a lot of people. And I don't think, to be honest, I don't think they understood John Baudrillard's point. Now, I've shared this idea many times on social media. I have shared it, I think, today. And so this could be any day. It doesn't matter which day I recorded this on. I share it all the time. Is it something... The current thing, as a matter of fact, and that's going to, going to be the title of this podcast, is The Current Thing Did Not Take Place. Something, John Baudrillard argued, happened in the Middle East. He said it was an atrocity masquerading as a war, kind of very famously. But he said it wasn't a war. There was no Gulf War at all. Now, I don't know if I agree with this particular argument, but I'll give it. This is what he said. One of his two arguments for why the Gulf War did not take place, allegedly, is that the Gulf War wasn't a war at all. The Iraqis were barely fighting. In fact, they frequently just kind of ran away or surrendered in large numbers. The American and other Western militaries flew in with jets and bombers and just absolutely obliterated the place, largely on false pretenses just absolutely obliterated the place, and a war should have some kind of question, is what he said. I'm not necessarily agreeing about who might win. There should be some actual combat, not just this brutal show of force from an absolutely superior uh, first world military going after a completely inferior third world military. I don't know if I agree with this particular line of thought, from Baudrillard. That's not the point. It's his other justification. The the Gulf War did not take place that I find fascinating and important and perceptive. Not that I agree with his claim that what's really taking place is global capitalism. I think it's actually a little bit different than that. Uh, It is this fascio communist tyranny conglomeration of all of the worst ideologies of the 20th century and earlier hammered into one uh, kind of beast that we're dealing with, which is why the leftist critiques are often not wrong, because there's the weird kind of quote-unquote conservative or quote-unquote right-wing Hegelian aspects to it or dialectical aspects versus the left, which is Marxist or neo-Marxist in its orientation uh, toward dialectical progress. But it's two dialectical programs happening. Neoconservatism, we might call the one versus, uh, which is like this nation building project to go and, you know, overthrow governments it doesn't like and do all kinds of espionage and all kinds of terrible things so that they can make their business interests that they're doing crony capitalism and, and, uh, government collusion, public private partnership with, uh, very rich. Uh, there's that, but then there's, the, there's the Marxist dialectical side too. And these two are in this weird, like, relationship, but the left side of it's criticizing the shit out of the right side of it, if we call it the right, and the right, if we'll allow that side of it, is criticizing the shit out of the left side of it, and they think, oh no, we're different from one another, but actually they're two sides of the same shitty coin. Um, Yes, that's true. Neocons are actually Hegelian operators. They're what we might call, instead of right-wing and left-wing, we really should call them the old Hegelians and young Hegelians kind of passed down the generations from the 1830s to now. Uh, they have very different, they accept Hegel in the dialectical processes of history virtually uh, without question. 
but they take two very different tacks toward it. And the left is Marxist and the right is this kind of weird neoconservative nation building thing. The old Hegelians in the 1830s and 40s believed that that era's Prussian government had achieved the optimum government system, which is this kind of constitutional monarchy that, hint, hint, Christian nationalism, that they then would spread around the world everywhere um, through whatever nation building processes and projects that they do. And that, that was the new project of completing history. While the leftists, of course, thought that the young Hegelians saw something completely different, was that we have to upend the entire system and we have to install what ultimately amounts to a communist tyranny. And so these two factions have never really gone away. They have positioned themselves as the only right and left wing where everybody else in the whole world is kind of staring like, what the hell? But I've gone on a pretty big digression here talking about this uh, this way because I want to talk about John Baudrillard's point with the Gulf War did not take place. So the more compelling argument that the war, like I said, it was three essays. One of them focuses on the fact that there was no real war going on in the first place, whatever you think of that. I don't personally um, believe that or care. There were military operations going on. He acknowledges that, but this is the essential point. He says, what we call the Gulf War. So you might put the Gulf War in scare quotes. The thing we call the Gulf War was primarily a propaganda operation by our governments and media. It was a war where while it was being fought, it was being broadcast live in a very contoured fashion by CNN and the BBC and other global news networks to tell the story to the West that it needed to hear to justify the atrocities as he would have it and maybe that is the right way to put it that were occurring in the Persian Gulf. In other words... The Gulf War, as a current thing at the time in the late 80s and early 90s, did not take place. The thing we think is the Gulf War never happened. Things happened. Something happened. Atrocities happened. Or total victory for one side happened, depending on your perspective. But what we saw and what we believed to be the Gulf War was always nothing more than a propaganda operation organized by governments, intelligence communities, and media and fed to the public. We can fast forward not from Bush Sr., but to Bush Jr., where he's talking about the weapons of mass destruction thing to justify the second Gulf War, which we know was a lie, in which we could easily see that the second of these uh, Gulf Wars did not take place, to Baudrillard's point. Not to say soldiers weren't deployed, not to say people didn't get killed, not to say bombs didn't go off or bullets weren't ripping through bodies or whatever other thing you need to to, to think about. Those things all happened. But what we were fed was a movie about a war. And so the thing that we think happened didn't happen. Now, the biggest expression of this, frankly, there's a lot of places where we could go with this. The biggest expression of this, frankly, and somebody told me this one time and it sort of blew my mind, is that the 20th century didn't take place. As a matter of, in the same meaning, obviously the century did pass. The years from 1900 to to the end of 1999 certainly occurred. That is the 20th century. Lots of things happened in history across and around the world. That's not the point. The point is that maybe nobody knows the true history of the 20th century. Maybe a lot of it got hidden, a lot of it got buried, a lot of it got used for propaganda purposes. A lot of it was contoured history fed to us through media apparatuses, highly contoured three-channel news, and so on, so that what everybody kind of believes to be the history of the 20th century is not real. We could go further with this level of skepticism and say all of history did not take place. Why? And I'm just going in the big direction. Well, because, as we know, history is written by the winners. Now, this has been a very fruitful line of uh, skepticism, radical skepticism, that's opened up the door to a lot of critical interpretations of history, like Howard Zinn's People's History of the United States, which is a complete fraud. Uh, It's been completely taken apart, completely destroyed. It's completely fraudulent. It's a communist propaganda track about about the history of the United States. But if you think history really was written by the winners, then what you're actually getting is not genuine history, whatever scholarship might dig in and find more truths later, which I think there's a lot of room 
uh, outside of the captured academy to believe that there's a lot of valid things happening to discover real historical truths. But if history was really written by the winners, that which we think is the history of our nation or our, the entire of Western civilization or of all of humanity did not take place. Now, this is why you have to be cautious with people like Baudrillard. When I say we make, he makes a point, I think the point, the point is very important, and it's about propaganda. However, this is where you also have to not fall off the left cliff. When you have ambiguity about what might have really happened in history, speaking of the 20th century or all of human history or the history of the United States or the history of Western civilization or Britain or whatever you want, and I picked very American-centric topics there just to give a middle finger to the people who don't want me to. It could be any place you want. Chinese history. We all know that Mao rewrote history to redescribe a new process and project of, of China. Uh, so Chinese history did not take place. Mao rewrote it. It's, it's fake. It's propaganda. Uh, but that aside, you don't want to fall off the left cliff, which Baudrillard is off the left cliff. Howard Zinn capitalizes on the people who fell off the left cliff to propagandize them into destructive bullshit. So you don't want to fall off the left cliff. The, 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 when you have this ambiguity, which is what I was saying, that is a call for careful, circumspect, very cautious, very evidence-based hypothesis and conjecture given and then pursued and resolved kinds of meticulous and rigorous research to find out the best of what can we can know about what happened and to state the ambiguity as clearly as possible where gaps are having to be filled in due to what we might call the fog of history and the lack of sources and so on. Falling off the left cliff means we don't really know what happened, and therefore let's use a critical approach to say this is the secret history that they didn't want you to know. That they, the winners, the colonizers, hid from you to hide how awful they were. That's falling off the left cliff. That ends up in tearing down statues. That ends up in destroying Columbus Day. That ends up in what we're seeing now with all of this... Uh, Israel versus so-called Palestine. That's falling off the left cliff. But let's go back to Baudrillard and his point, because I think that everything that I was just saying about the issue not being the issue, the issue being the revolution, can actually be contoured very, very carefully and very usefully in terms of what Baudrillard was saying. So the Gulf War did not take place. It was a propaganda job. The thing we call the Gulf War, which is separate from the, the conflict in the Gulf itself, now, I'll try to be as clear about that as possible, but every time I say Gulf War, put it in scare quotes. That's a brand name for a film that we were shown by CNN, BBC, and our intelligence communities and government. Put that in your head. When I say Gulf War, I mean that. The conflict in the Persian Gulf, I'll try to use, to, I'll try to use that phrasing to describe things, that, to talk about the, thing that actually, the things that actually happened there. So the Gulf War did not take place. Here's the thing. That was an issue, the war, the conflict in the Persian Gulf, that was not an issue. The issue was some other revolutionary project of Hegelian dialectical wizards, neocons in this case primarily, who wanted to move history toward their desired end. Do you see that? So the Gulf War did not take place, but what are some other things, not just all of history, that did not take place? I think it's easy to say that while SARS Cove 2 happened, there was a virus, unless we believe Michael Yeadon, who thinks there was not. And with the flu numbers, who knows? But I've had, I've had a virus a few times now that has a different profile than any of the sicknesses I remember getting that has certain signatures like being extraordinarily tired and brain fogged afterwards um, that seems unresponsive to a lot of the medications that I sometimes take to, to have a more manageable existence while sick that I have no reason to doubt might represent something like SARS-CoV-2 or some variant of a coronavirus that well, may have very well been modified in a lab or whatever else. So I think that the, 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 the disease itself probably happens. Maybe it's, a, maybe it's just as crazy coronavirus. Maybe it was a lab experiment. Maybe it's some weird strain of the flu. 
I don't think so, but I'm just saying. That's beside the point. Something happened. People were getting sick. Their signature of getting sick, at least in my personal experience, has been distinctly different. As somebody who travels a lot and spends a lot of time in crowds with poor sleep and poor diet and everything else that comes with traveling a ton, sleeping in hotels, conferences, or whatever, I get sick, unfortunately, kind of a lot. I get a lot of colds. There are colds, there's the flu, they feel different, and then there's this, and it's different. So I'm fairly well convinced that there's something going around that's new and different that matches nothing I've ever had, particularly with the awful and peculiar wave of tired that comes after the weird persistent fever that I've experienced with no other cult, just beside the point. Anyway, let's just say SARS-CoV-2 took place, but COVID-19 did not take place. COVID-19 was a propaganda effort by our governments, the media, our intelligence communities, to do lockdowns, to mask the population, to threaten us with vaccines, to divide us into masker versus anti-masker, people who want to kill grandma, the pandemic of the unvaccinated versus the good vaccinated people who did what they're supposed to, like, like you know, Mayor Bill de Blasio is like eating french fries in the most disgusting manner ever, offering people like free donuts and a $50 or something if they got a shot in their arm of some untested substance that might have been contaminated. I'm just saying, COVID-19 did not take place. COVID-19 was a political operation on our populations globally. It had agendas, it had reasons, and those reasons had little to nothing to do with health and Public health itself seems not to be taking place at all. It seems to just be a mechanism for social control hiding as science, statistics, and, and medicine. Um, but but co- that's a good example, right? So just like we said, uh, the, or like Baudrillard said, the Gulf War did not take place. In the same way, COVID-19 did not take place. I already mentioned the Ukraine conflict the first day that this broke out. Literally the first day I got yelled at by some notable people who I, for politeness reasons, won't name right now, in person on that first week for saying that I was very suspicious about this conflict. Um, the first thing I said was the conflict in Ukraine is not taking place. Yes, there are things happening. Yes, people are dying. Yes, it's horrible. Yes, blah, blah, blah. So there's conflict in Ukraine. I don't know what to call this thing. Ukraine war, Russia, Ukraine war. I don't know what to call it. But that did not take place. Again, this is a propaganda effort that's trying to tell Western populations what it needs to believe so that we can justify sending hundreds of billions of dollars into whatever whatever's going on there, whether it's a money laundering operation, whether it's uh, an attempt to force Russia's hand so that bricks can get built to diminish the West, to break the dollar, whatever the purpose really is, there's a revolutionary purpose to sending more and more and more money, you can tell because the Democrats and who can trust them at this point are all but hell-bent to make sure that every single thing that happens in Congress somehow provides a provision to throw money at Ukraine, even more of U.S. taxpayer money at Ukraine. Something's fake as hell with this. It's not to say that there aren't people suffering and dying. Well, as Hegel said, because this is all Hegelian wizardry on populations, History uses people and then discards them. So it's using these poor people as collateral damage and discarding them. But it turns out that this conflict that we think is happening, and I think we're all pretty getting pretty clear on that something's fishy, did not take place in the Baudrillardian sense. So COVID-19 did not take place. Ukraine conflict did not take place. What about Black Lives Matter? Did Black Lives Matter take place? No, it did not. It turns out that Black Lives Matter did not take place. This was a complete mass line effort based on tons of fraud in a huge media propaganda campaign that looks like it was also coordinated through our government and our our, uh, intelligence communities. Once again, kind of the same story that Baudrillard, we don't want to fall off a left or right cliff here, but we do want to have that do skepticism and cynicism about what's really going on. Why do I say that? Well, for example... Do I have the guy's name right? Is it Eric Stewart? Was a professor at Florida State University who had produced all of the data that were used to convince people with these studies that there was systematic, uh, or systemic, I guess, but really systematic. Systemic is something different. Racism in policing across America. Well, it turns out that that guy got fired. His tenured professor got fired. Why? Because he fabricated all of his data. It was all a fraud. It was all fake. George Floyd 
people are finally starting to look back at this, did not die from the white cop with his knee on him. He died from fentanyl overdose. How about that? How about that? So did BLM, a lot of stuff happened. A lot of people had their lives destroyed. A lot of businesses retooled themselves, completely onboarded a ton of DEI crap they're going to spend a decade getting rid of that they're suffering under. They have no options. They don't know what to do. As a result of this, lots of stuff happened. But guess what? The whole thing was a giant fraud. P.S. It'd be really great if we had some districts. You know, if some goofy DA in Fulton County, Georgia can indict a bunch of lawyers and Trump for conspiracy and RICO, maybe some red districts in the country could indict BLM leaders for charitable fraud, which happened on a rampant scale, and it isn't even, like, ambiguous. Maybe that could happen. I'm just suggesting. But that besi- that's beside the point. The point that I'm making is the entire BLM Black Lives Matter movement did not take place. Yes, it certainly did, but no, what it was was all on false pretenses to run a mass line. What was the point of the mass line? Well, the issue was not the issue. It's not really about police racism. How the hell could it be? That was based on fake data. It's not about a white cop murdering George Floyd, which he even got convicted for in a court of law, even though the report in the coroner's report said that's not what killed him. And then the coroner had to lie about it for whatever weird reasons. How could it possibly be the case that that happened when all of it's based on fraud? The whole thing is a propaganda job. The whole thing was therefore an operation. So the right name for it is Operation George Floyd or Operation BLM. The whole thing was to push the cultural revolution in the United States to divide us along racial lines, to get us to fight. I spent two years of my life helping people decode critical race theory where critical race theory is a useful tool until the very minute we figure out what it is, which is race Marxism, and that becomes a dominant view, at which point, I promise you, they will jettison it because critical race theory is not the issue. The issue is the revolution, and only that which is useful to the revolution gets capped. That's how it works. Robin DiAngelo, you might remember, people noticed that she's a white woman grifting off of all this racial uh, division and trauma that she's causing people in order to sell training for $30,000 an hour or whatever it was. And people happen to notice she made millions of dollars literally from her crack-ass crack book, White Fragility, which is literally not just a Puritan humiliation in, in the anti-racism religion, but one of the most abusive and, and idiotic books I've ever read in my life, and I've had the displeasure of reading it three times, is, you know, chapter 11 in White Fragility is literally called White Women's Tears. And it's about how white when white women cry, they're doing racism because it's kind of like they're trying to get white men to sweep in or even sometimes black men to uh, come protect the poor white girl and then do a racism like poor Emmett Till. This I'm not shitting you. That's chapter 11. This book is psychotic. It's a long Puritan style humiliation, which is a technical term, confession of Robin's deep seated and and abiding racism that she feels that she's obtained uh, a confession of salvation from by becoming an anti-racist, which she sees as a lifelong process, a lifelong commitment, I should say, to an ongoing process of self-criticism, self-reflection and social activism. She's confessed in the religion, so she's saved, right? But she's not. she doesn't feel saved because she knows she's still a racist bitch. And so the problem is, is that she has to humiliate herself. This is what the Puritans did. They confessed. They took Jesus into their lives. They didn't feel saved. They didn't feel worthy of grace. And so they humiliated themselves in writing, in self-flagellation, all kinds of things. And it was called a humiliation. And on the far side of humiliation, if you do it well enough, there's justification. And then you can have sanctification and glorification if you follow the whole salvation pathway. Okay, great. That's what she's written. But it turns out that this whole thing, this whole huge grift, the whole project was all based on fraud. The whole thing was really just to advance the revolution. And we argued for so long, decoding it, Is it good? Is it in schools? Is it not? We're still arguing about it years later. But the whole point of BLM was to advance revolution. And the second it stops being productive or the second it stops bearing fruit or the second it becomes a liability. You remember how BLM got recoded as buying large mansions after we saw that the leaders of BLM took those 
crazy amounts of money and bought themselves huge mansions. And then the, everybody that just kind of, they just kind of disappeared and it's all local chapters now, like the Chicago BLM. It's not like a, it's not like a big, huge thing anymore. And like when they found out that it was like solidarity with queer, blah, 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 that just came down off the website. It's because the issue is never the issue. The issue is just advancing the revolution. And that's how this works. So where did the Black Lives Matter money go? Went on to a bunch of queer initiatives, as it turns out, like was originally on their website till they got caught with that and it weirded people out. And they're like, why is this here? Because the issue, like an intersectionality, allows them to switch from one issue to the other whenever they want. Because the issue is not the issue. The issue is revolution. The issue is to keep the revolutionary energy, the revolutionary momentum, the revolutionary division going and to get people fighting about the next current thing. So that didn't take place either. This whole drag queen story hour, for no, drag queen story hour did not take place. Yes, they did put drag queens in schools. Yes, they did use it to groom your children. Yes, you can read the paper and hear that it's specifically about grooming kids. Yes, yes, yes. Why? Because it advances revolution. In particular, it will help build the Rainbow Guard. It will create a destabilized young uh, body of young people that are angry at their society, that are injured. Many of them, like I said earlier in the in the podcast, are likely to agitate for socialized medicine when they realize how expensive the rest of their life is going to be because they got broken by this. The whole point, whether it's Drag Queen Story Hour or the rest of Queer Theory, comprehensive sexuality education, is to advance the revolution. These people are alienated from their cell, themselves. They're alienating from their families. They're alienating from normal friends. They can only have queer friends now. They're alienating from their faiths. They're alienating from their broader community. And they're holing up in the queer cult, which we know is a Gnostic and Hermetic cult of destruction and transformation, self-transformation into something that's useful until it's no longer useful. We also see that trans violence is violence. It comes up again and again and again. The examples are copious. There are lots of reasons for it. Imagine being that frustrated with your life while on being pumped full of hormones. Lots of problems going on here. Well, guess what? They're useful till they're not. And then same thing. The issue, all of a sudden, we had a trans shooter in Nashville shoot up a school. The manifesto became this super secret thing. It's leaked now, but it took leaking it. It never was let out. And we have this huge, all of a sudden, deflation going in through April of that whole mass line because all of a sudden people's eyes opened and people, basically the low information people weren't as low information about what was going on anymore. And Marxists can't make use of low information people who are not low information. So... The line of attack changed somewhat, but not completely. So guess what? Same story. Same story. That whole phenomenon, queer activism did not take place. Because it's not actually about whether or not kids... They tell you openly it's not about whether kids are LGB. And we can stop there because T is a manufactured thing. It's not about whether or not kids have gender dysphoria. It's about whether or not they can be made to live queerly and adopt queer politics or a stance of queerness, which is defined by David Halperin explicitly in the book titled Saint Foucault from 1995, which is where queer got its definition in the first place. He said that it is an identity without an essence that is defined in terms of being oppositional to, and I quote, whatever is normal, legitimate, and dominant. That's it. It's just throw, it's just flip the table of society. Anything considered normal, anything considered dominant, and I'm holding, I put them out of order here because the last one I'm going to say matters most. Anything legitimate, queer, Identity means being intrinsically politically opposed to anything that's legitimate. And the whole point is to create revolutionaries. Literally, in this case, I think a broken youth group uh, population surrounded by allies and friends who are kind of caught up in a similar milieu, but their social circles are all caught up in the huge cancellation uh, struggle session dynamic around queer theory so that they can have a rainbow guard. We remember what Mao did with the rainbow guard in 1967. The, rain, uh, the red guard went running amok. They had taken over almost everything. They've been very successful. They rounded up the new president of China who had replaced Mao, Liu Xiaoqi, by default Mao's biggest political rival. They pulled him out of the presidential palace. They started to humiliate him and do a struggle session and, and, and torture him uh, in public. He said, am I not a citizen? Can I not speak? They said, no, you're not a citizen. You're an enemy of the people. There you go, president of the CCP, literally leader of the party, enemy of the people, and they humiliated him, 
destroyed his life, sent him off to the countryside to die in primitive conditions a a few months later, if I'm not mistaken. Mao seized power. Did he thank his Red Guard? Maybe in the moment. But within months, he declared them too radical and had the People's Liberation Army go and round them up and send them off to die in primitive conditions in the countryside or killed them outright. The entire uh, mass murdering mob was no longer useful to that stage of the Cultural Revolution. And so Mao moved on to other things and had them deposed. Now, here's the thing. A lot of those poor brainwashed assholes got on the trains to the countryside saying that hard labor in the fields would wash their brains even more red. It would make them even more communist, even better comrades. Most of them never came back from that. A few of them maybe did. They got brainwashed out of being red guards, but most of them were so brainwashed that they willingly went, enthusiastically went to their own miserable deaths. Why? Because the issue is never the issue. The issue is always revolution. Mao achieved the hit stage of the revolution, so... The issues motivating and the, the, the group that he motivated to to do those things was no longer necessary and was destroyed. The Rainbow Guard, I think, maybe its ultimate purpose is to create massive amounts of agitation, massive amounts of uh, alienation and individuation, atomization, really, to break families and communities apart, to, to disaffect from faith, to cause all this kind of self-loathing to, to ooze out. But all in this break society, but also to agitate eventually for socialist medicine. Um, and then when that's no longer useful, I have a feeling that, that this is not going to be supported. Now, one of the ways, of course, it's useful not to get lost in this issue is that it's going to make these medical establishments of billions and billions of dollars until that's turned into a gigantic liability and a class action lawsuit of hundreds of thousands of broken young people. Uh, comes down on them to the tune of probably like a trillion dollars and really wrecks some uh, evil medical establishments. And good luck to those people when that comes, and it is coming. Uh, But that issue is also not the issue. We can go on. It doesn't matter because it's a current thing. Right now it's Israel versus Palestine. They've launched a bunch of current things. Elon Musk buying Twitter, that became a current thing. There were a lot of current things. The thrust is that the current thing did not take place. And this isn't, it's the same thing as the issue is never the issue. The issue is always the revolution. When you realize that the current thing and all of the fighting about it are a contrivance, a propaganda job, a mass line campaign to cause all of the arguing and fighting about the details and the sides, to split people into two sides that don't like each other. Particularly, do you see the left fragmented over this issue, by the way? You do not. But you see the right splintering around it. You see normal conservative people taking sides. Well, I don't know. The Palestinians have a point. But on the other hand, I'm really not sure. The anti-woke brigade is, it's like they've driven this like iron wedge into the coalition that we were building to fight back against woke and against BlackRock and all that. It's like they've stuck this iron wedge and we're just watching that coalition splinter as we argue in the dialectic that they contrived for us around Gaza Floyd. But that's the thing. Gaza Floyd is the current thing. BLM was the current thing. COVID-19 was the current thing. The Gulf War was the current thing. The Ukraine thing is the current thing. Something about Elon Musk and digital misinformation, that was a current thing. Whatever, you know, you've seen the meme with the army of NPC Wojaks walking around with they're changing out the plug in their brain about what they're supposed to be mad about next. That's the current thing. And the current thing did not take place. The current thing is a psychological mass line on the population meant to divide the enemies of that which is the real problem. The regime, whatever you want to call it, the masters of the universe. I like to call them the masters of the universe. That's what that is. So why is this so important? Why does it matter to have this skepticism, this cynicism without falling off the cliff? on either side, without falling off the left cliff into critical theory about all, all of everything, or fall off the right cliff into uh, this kind of um, reactionary fascist thing, which, by the way, the pendulum's starting to swing that way. We're seeing Nazi stuff all over the place now. I think that the masters of the universe are going to switch from communism to fascism next and push it really hard, and the money's going to go that way, and everybody that's on the left is going to be super confused, except most of them will, surprisingly, get on board. They just spent 10 years telling everybody to punch a Nazi. And when the chip comes out, 
and plugs back in with a swastika on it, they're going to go, they're going to go be Nazis. Do you not understand? The, but the point is, why does this matter? The current thing did not take place means that the current thing is a psychological mass line means that it's an operation means it has a purpose. One of which is to divide us and get us fighting about it and its details in de- tiny amounts of minutia, whatever with huge amounts of emotional vitriol pointed at one another to split us apart so that we don't see the operational purpose, whether it's to import lots of people to water down our populations and flood it with violent potential sleeper cells or some other process. What are some other purpose to trigger a gigantic war, World War III, on the pretext of this conflict breaking out the way that it did? That's another possibility to form bricks in order to create the challenge to the U.S. dollar. There's your Ukraine current thing did not take place. Do you see how it works? So when you understand that the current thing did not take place, in other words, that the current thing, while stuff is certainly happening and it certainly matters, and the truth of what's happening actually also matters and requires investigation and clarification, the thing itself that we're being fed is a psychological mass line, a propaganda campaign meant to achieve operational goals. And if you can identify those and get ahead of them and call them out, you can actually steal that what's called reflexive energy from the movement that they're ginning up. And then you can actually do something to dent it. That's how you end up not getting a vaccine passport or a facial recognition camera to solve the crime crisis out West or to uh, break through with you know, climate change did not take place. Jesus, the climate crisis did not take place. The multi-crisis, the poly crisis did not take place. All of those things, all of these things, all of them are designed to facilitate what Klaus Schwab called the great narrative for the better future, which if you read from his book, I'm summarizing, I don't have it in front of me. I mean, I actually do have the book open on my browser, but I'm not going to go find it and waste your time. The great narrative is we have all these poly crisis things happening to us at the same time. And it's so much velocity and it's so much chaos and it's so overwhelming that what we need is more centralized global government to get through it. And that's because the issue the crisis inside the poly crisis, the poly crisis itself, the current thing, whether it's a war, whether it's a virus, whether it's a social movement, whatever, or those things mixed together, whether it's something happens and, and Gaza Floyd happens and you have queers for Palestine and sex workers for Palestine, like, ha ha ha, like literally, really, what does is, what is Palestine for queers look like? Looks like people getting thrown off a of roof and stoned. Um, you know, Palestine for queers is a completely different project, right? Um just think about it. And so all of these things, the poly crisis, each crisis within the poly crisis, all of this conflict and the way that it's fed to us through this drumbeat of psych- psychosis inducing mass media, social media provocations, fake accounts on social media, provocateurs on social media, bot swarms, people hired by entities like the United Nations, the British government, intelligence communities to go cause different disinformation campaigns or to disagree or argue with accounts or into the, the mentions of accounts who are disagreeing or they're seeing through the narrative. All of that is what the current thing is. And if you can step above that and say, no, it's purposed. Those are all the current thing. The current thing is not the thing. The current thing did not take place. The issue is never the issue. The issue is always a revolution. And if you can call out the way that it maneuvers toward the revolution, you actually have a fighting chance at deflating the reflexive energy that they need to achieve it. In other words, you can, and we have, and we will again, in more and faster and better, beat them at this game by realizing that the current thing they've manufactured and fed to us based off of things that are actually happening in the world that are not being portrayed according to what they actually are, are operations meant to move us toward their revolution that we can figure out, identify, call out ahead of time, and put a stop to. When we get to that point, I think they're already, frankly, it's like... They're already in a death spiral. Let me just summarize real quick, and I'll, I'll say my point was that we can stop these people. 
but they're in a death spiral. This is a white pill to end on. I feel like what they need for these reflexive things to happen is enough trust in the media, the the, the propaganda, the current thing, the mass line, the, the psychological operation, whatever words we want to use for it. They need enough trust in that so that the reflexive environment takes off. It did sort of coming out of left field with this Muslim versus Jew thing in uh, so-called Palestine versus Israel. But we're getting better at not getting caught on our heels. Uh, and so what the reason is because think of it like a giant, I don't know a better metaphor off the top of my head, giant bathtub full of trust. They need that bathtub really full of trust. That's what that lady said at the World Economic Forum. The good news is that the elites trust one another more and more. The bad news is the people do not trust the elites at all. That's what I'm talking about right there. That right there is everything because it's like we pulled the plug out of their bathtub of trust. And what you see is all that trust swirling down the drain and there's less and less and less and less and less. So every time they pull a current thing, which is a psychological mass line on us, every time they or active measure, I should say, that's the word I've been looking for this whole time. Every time they pull a current thing on us, it diminishes our trust in them as we start to see through it and suspect them. But the less trust we have, the less we fall for the next current thing, which puts them in a death spiral. Their trust goes down every time they, tr our trust in them, I should say, goes down every time they try to pull this stuff. So if you remember that the issue is never the issue, the issue is always a revolution. If you remember that the current thing did not take place, it doesn't matter. If you just remember that they're all active measures, psychological active measures, propaganda active measures, mass lines taking place in the streets, as active measures, as direct action is the right word for that actually, in order to advance the revolution and that the issue behind it, the current thing behind it is irrelevant. It's a tool, it's a prop, it's something that they use in the meantime to advance the goals. Then we can stop fighting about the thing they want us fighting about and start calling out the thing that stops them from advancing their crooked evil revolution that will enslave us all. So thanks for listening. I, I hope this helps.